Um, so thanks a lot. Today we'll be talking about seven ways to hang yourself with Google Android. Um, namely, we'll be discussing the seven most common security mistakes that we think developers can make uh, while writing Android applications. A few words about ourselves. My name's Katrina, and I'm the founding member of security research group at Fortify Software. Now we're part of HP. Uh, I primarily work on static analysis tools, so I'm trying to you know, figure out how they can detect uh, security vulnerabilities in the code automatically. And I'm always trying to improve the tools and figure out how to detect more different types of vulnerabilities. So now we're um, uh, looking at Android. Um, you know, I got interested in security when I was a student at UCSD. I took computer, computer security class and got fascinated with the subject and stayed around and, you know, actually managed to do my master's thesis in, in security. And so here I am. Um, I have a pleasure of co-presenting this talk with a colleague of mine from UC Berkeley, Erica Chen, and she is going to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Erica Chin. I'm a PhD student in computer science at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm in the security research group. I received my uh, undergrad degree at University of Virginia. My current research interest is in improving mobile phone security. And uh, my most recent work was on vulnerabilities in inter-application communication in Android. Before we proceed, I want to emphasize, emphasize that this talk is a um, is a great example of collaboration between the industry and academia, and we're very, very, very excited to be working with each other uh, because we get to um, incorporate all the analysis techniques uh, that we both are working on into Fortify's tools, and these tools are used by, you know, enterprises all over the world. So let's begin. Um, we divided the talk into four sections. First, we're going to briefly introduce Android platform. We're basically not sure how many of you are familiar with it and to what extent. So we're going to just give you a brief intro uh, enough so you'll be able to follow the rest of the talk. Um, then we're going to talk about the seven security vulnerabilities that we think are going to be very, very common in um, real world Android applications. Then we'll talk about um, the results of empirical analysis. And we'll conclude with some observations and lessons learned. In terms of um, introduction to Google Android, we're going to discuss architecture, security model, and also application breakdown. Basically, you know, um, Android manifest, which is a configuration file that comes with every Android application um, component of uh, Android application and also inter-component communication. So Android is built on top of Linux kernel. So basically, it provides you know, things like device drivers and memory management. On top of the kernel, we have some native libraries written in C and C++, and uh, they provide things like graphics and database management and you know, browser engine WebKit, for example. These can be accessed via Java interfaces. Uh, on top of the native libraries, there is a modified uh, virtual machine, which is called Dalvik virtual machine which uh, runs .dex rather than .class files. Um, let's see, Android applications are written in Java, and they're written uh, using the Google Android SDK, uh, which is basically a Java interface that allows you to access systems and services of the Android platform. So the whole idea behind mobile platform is the fact that you're going to be running lots and lots of different uh, applications on your system. And so you might be, you know, installing and down downloading um, a banking application that's going to be dealing with some sensitive data. And on the other hand, uh, you might be installing um, a game application right next to it and running on the same system. And you obviously don't want your game application to be able to access the sensitive data that uh, your banking application is operating on. So in order to achieve this, um, Android platform uh, makes sure that every application is isolated from each other. So basically, whenever you, you know, download and install an application, every application is given a unique UID, and therefore, um, an application, each application runs as a separate process in a separate VM, 
And typically, applications cannot talk to each other uh, and see each other's, well, they can talk to each other, but they can't see each other's private data unless you do something um, funny. Because um, the platform is built on top of Linux, Linux style file permissions apply. But what's specific to Android platform is this whole system of permissions, so provided by Google. Um, permissions allow you to protect access to things like uh, sensitive APIs, so APIs that allow you to access, um, you know, location services, network, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, etc. Permission system also allows you to protect access to um, content providers, which are basically databases, and it also protects um, inter and intra application communication. Permissions are requested by an application uh, at install time, and so they're also granted once or denied at install time, and then at runtime they're enforced. And uh, now let's talk about the different components of Android applications. So applications are divided into components. Um, there are four types of components. The first type of component is an activity. And activities is, is they're basically the user interfaces. So each uh, screen you see on your Android application, that's its own activity. Uh, services are uh, components, they run in the background and they don't interact with the user. So these are well suited for uh, long running processes. Uh, so like if you wanted to implement a music player, things that run in the background, that's what a service would be for. Uh, broadcast receivers receive messages from other components. So this can be like uh, for things like uh, system event notifications or uh, messages from third party applications. And finally we have component, uh, content providers. And uh, content providers are basically, you can think of them as databases. So each application uh, contains a manifest and the manifest does a couple things. Um, first of all, it declares application components. Um, so as you can see here, we have an example of an Android manifest. And here it's declared there's a my activity and a my receiver. So the components are declared here. And uh, if the developer doesn't declare the components here, then the system would not know about them. Uh, the manifest also specifies application requirements. So this can be things like uh, platform versions or input configurations or uh, sp specific hardware requirements. So in this example you can see here that uh, the developer is requesting um, the camera feature, it's using the camera feature, um, and it's also requiring that the minimum SDK version be 8. So most importantly, uh, the manifest is where uh, permissions are requested. So uh, as Katrina said, these are things that are denied or granted uh, at install time. And so here we have uh, this application is requesting the internet and camera permission. And finally, developers can also uh, create their own permissions. And these will be applied to the global system. Um, so here we have a new permission being created and the developer can also set how that permission is to be obtained. So they can say that it's a normal permission and will be granted automatically on install. They can say that it, it needs the approval of the user or it can require that uh, the, an application requesting this permission has the same signature as the application that defined this permission. So despite the default isolation that uh, Katrina had mentioned, uh, applications can communicate between one another through the use of intents. And you can basically think of intents as messages. Um, they're sent between components uh, of applications. Furthermore, applications can be sent between components within the application and also components in different applications. So you're using the same mechanism um, for both inter and intra application communication. Um, and as said before, uh, notif they can also be used for event notifications from the system. So there are two types of intents, uh, explicit intents and implicit intents. So explicit intents are intents where the sender specifies the recipient by name. So in this example we have the Yelp application and I'm sure all of you are familiar with Yelp. Um, you can pick a restaurant and then uh, there's, a, there's a feature where it will show you where that restaurant's located on a map. And so suppose the Yelp application had a particular map application that they wanted to use. So to do this, Yelp simply creates 
an explicit intent, addresses it to that particular map application, and then sending the intent will launch that map application. So in this example, with explicit intents, it's important to note that only the specified destination will receive this message. So the other type of intents um, are implicit intents. And these are intents without a specific uh, destination. So instead, the developer uh, specifies this thing called an action in the message. And it, then it leaves it up to the system to, de to determine uh, which component is most suited to handle that particular uh, action. So actions are meant to describe the general uh, requirements of the intent. Um, and this is so that the sending application, the Yelp application, um, doesn't need to know what other applications are installed on the phone. So actions should specify what the receiving component uh, should do. Uh, so some common uh, actions include the view action, the edit action, but really the action can be uh, any, any string created by the developer. So going back to the Yelp application, um, they could have sent an implicit intent with the view action. And then the system will then look at the receiving components and look at what actions can be handled. And in this case, there's only one component that can handle the view action. So the system will deliver this intent to that map application. So in a couple cases, um, there may be more than one application that can handle this action. Um, so depending on the type of the request, requesting component, um, either the user will be prompted to choose what the receiving application should be, or the system might decide what that application should be, or the system will deliver it to all possible uh, recipients that can receive that particular action. So in this example, let's say the system will deliver this intent to the browser application instead. So just to give you an example of the code snippets for these intents, um, in the first example, you see the explicit intent. And you can see that uh, this intent is the class name is being set. So that's the destination that's being set. And this intent should be used when the developer has a specific recipient in mind. And in the second code snippet, you can see the implicit intent. So this, the class name is not being set. Instead, an action is being set. And this should be used when the developer uh, just needs some component to handle a specific task. So we have all this intent communication. How can components protect themselves? Um, so components can limit their exposure to intents in two ways. First, uh, components can be made accessible to other applications, so explicitly exported, so visible to all applications. Or they can be made private, so only visible to other components within the same application. So the good news is that by default, when you declare components, uh, they're, they're set to being private. However, when a component is registered to receive, that it can receive an action, so it's re regi registered to receive implicit intents, um, this component is automatically changed to being a public component. Um, and this can be pretty dangerous because it's not something that the developer is explicitly setting, um, just the status is changing from private to public. Um, and the second way to protect a protect a component is through permissions. So a uh, receiving component can require that a sender has a permission to send to that component. So an example of that second um, requirement is, so on the right side we have application two. This has two public components. One retrieves a picture and it requires the retrieve permission. Uh, the other one takes a picture and it requires the camera permission. And then on the left-hand side, we have an application, uh, and it has the retrieve permission. So in this example, the displays picture component in application one uh, can send an intent to the retrieve uh, picture component because it has a retrieve permission. It can't send the intent to the takes picture component because it doesn't have the camera permission. So now that I've given you an introduction of Google Android, uh, let's get into the seven ways to hang yourself with Android. So the most common uh, developer uh, mistakes that will make your application vulnerable. So I'll be talking about unauthorized intent receipt, intent spoofing, uh, and persistent messages. And these are all related to, um, they're all communication related vulnerabilities. And then I'll also be talking about insecure storage.
And then Katrina is going to be talking about insecure network communication, SQL injection, and overprivileged applications. So the first attack we have here is unauthorized intent receipt. So in this attack, a malicious application intercepts an intent or steals an intent. So this will occur when the intent that's being sent is implicit, so it's public to the system, um, and it doesn't require that any receiving components have any particularly strong permissions. Um, so what happens in this as a result, like any, basically if this intent is stolen, any data in that intent will, you know, the attacker will get that data. Um, and it can also change the control flow of the application. So if the intent was to request a specific uh, display, the user interface and activity, um, then, and if an attacker provides that display, now the attacker has, you know, control of the screen, and if the user gets prompted to put in their password, then the attacker will steal that information. Um, so as a reminder on the bottom, we have a code snippet of the implicit intent. Here it's the set action is being called. And so one of the examples that we found in our analysis um, is from the IMDB application. So this application has a feature where the user can uh, request to get show times listed for movies in the area. And so to do this, the application has a component, Showtime Search, and it sends information and it sends a request to the results UI, which then will update the user screen. So the user display, um, the, the display will either update the screen with the latest showtimes available or it will say that no showtimes are available at all. So this is an example of what the user might see. Here you can see that there is a couple movies listed and it'll have times. So the problem with this, um, with this scenario is that instead of sending an, a direct explicit intent um, between these, these components, the developer chose to use an implicit intent. So it made both the intent and also the receiver public. So um, in this, just as a reminder, remember implicit intents means it's going to the system, the system is resolving where that um, destination should be. So all a malicious application needs to do is register another component, say that it can handle the same actions as the legitimate receiving component, and then when this intent is sent implicitly, um, the system may deliver the intent to the eavesdropping application. So in the case of the IMDB application, the attacker finds out a couple things. The attacker knows that the IMDB application is being used by the user, they know that the user is looking for show times, and then any intent, um, any data in that intent can also be stolen by the attacker. Um, we've seen this vulnerability in other applications as well. Um, there's another bus, a, a bus application that um, where the user can get information on where a bus is and when it'll next arrive. And in that application, the attacker can eavesdrop on the bus request and determine what the user's location is. So. As you can imagine, this is a very clear privacy violation. So our recommended fix for this problem is to use explicit intents whenever possible. So set the class name. Um, and if you're using a broadcast um, and you want it to go to multiple recipients, then you can also consider adding permissions to that request. So require that the recipients have a permission. Um, and in any case, regardless of whether the intent is holding any sensitive data, don't unnecessarily expose the data in that intent. So if you're only communicating in, within the, an application, um, you don't need it to go out to the system. You know what the recipient component's names are. So, um, what just happened? Uh, okay. Um, so the second, the second uh, vulnerability we have is intent spoofing. So in this, this is the attack is that the malicious application is sending an, int an intent into a legitimate application. So if the legitimate application just trusts the data, trusts the intent, then, you know, and it uses the data in the intent, then that would result in data injection. Um, if it receiving that intent will change the state of the application, that can also occur. And so this problem arises when components are public and they don't require the senders to have any strong permissions. 
So here we have a reminder of the code. Um, this is a receiver being declared in a manifest. And as you can see here, it's declaring that it can receive this action, my intent action. So it's being, it's being made a public component. So this attack exploits a vulnerability on the receiving side. So let's go back to the IMDB example. We had the receiving component that updates with showtimes or says that there's no location error. So if you recall, it was receiving an implicit intent, which made that component public. And so as a result, a malicious application can simply send, send an intent to that component. So it can either send it explicitly or implicitly. And if an act attacker does this, then if the attacker in particular is sending the no location error, then, uh, then the user will get informed that there are no movie showtimes available. So instead of what you would see on the left, which is the list of all the showtimes, um, the user would um, basically, it would be a denial of service. So the user would see that there are no, location, uh, no movies available. Um, and then going back to another example, um, in, in the same bus application as before, uh, an attacker can in inject fake bus information into a component. Um, so the user would see, oh, this bus is arriving at X time, potentially a lie. So the user could basically wait for a bus that never arrives. So our recommended fix for this problem um, is to use the exported flag when declaring components um, and explicitly make the component public or private. So always, always make it, like even if you don't need to, always make it um, explicitly stated um, and you know, make it private when, whenever possible. Um, if the situation is that the component is supposed to be a uh, public component, then consider limiting the interface by requiring that the sender has a permission. So in the second example, you can see that even though the exported flag is true, it also has a permission. So it's limiting the uh, types of intents that can be sent to this component. So in any case, make sure that public components aren't uh, performing any sensitive operations. So our third vulnerability, vulnerability type is uh, persistent messages. And in Android, these are called sticky broadcasts. Um, and this is a particular attack. It's a special case of the unauthorized intent receipt, which is the first attack we presented. Um, to give you a little background first, uh, broadcast intents, they're instead of the typical one-to-one -one communication, it's a one-to-many communication. So one message is being sent to any components that can um, receive, potentially receive this message. And then a sticky broadcast is a broadcast intent that persists. So it's expected to stay around and um, they're accessible after they've been delivered already, and they're rebroadcast to any future new receivers. So there are a couple problems with this uh, new type of intent. Um, so like the typical unauthorized intent receipt problem, uh, any malicious attacker could basically steal data, any data con contained in the intent. But this is a special, a special type of intent. So there are two other things that can happen. Um, so first of all, sticky broadcasts can't be restricted to a certain set of recipients. So you can't require that the recipient has a permission. So there's no limitation on that. Um, and also, the, this intent is um, expected to stay around. And so the problem here is there's this expectation, but anyone with a broadcast sticky permission um, can steal that intent and remove it permanently. So here's an example that illustrates that um, we have, on the left, we have a list of sticky broadcasts, um, and, and then we have a malicious receiver. Um, and this receiver has the broadcast sticky permission, which is a normal permission. It gets granted uh, by default when you install an application, so the user doesn't see it. Um, and what the attacker can do is basically remove this sticky broadcast. Um, and so as a result, this new receiver, the victim application that appears later, won't get this data in the sticky broadcast. So our recommendations for this uh, vulnerability is that regular broadcasts should be used whenever possible, um, and these broadcasts should be used with the requirement of having the recipients have a permission. Um, and also, regardless, don't put any sensitive data in a sticky broadcast. Anyone can read it. <laughs> 
Our fourth uh, vulnerability is um, on insecure storage. So what can happen when you have insecure storage? So people will save their passwords, location, contact information, all sensitive data. Um, and if storage is insecure, then this can be stolen. So we're looking at specifically at the SD card. So the SD card has files, and these are all world readable. So anyone can read it. Um, users can read it. It can be synced to your computer. So your computer will have those files. Um, and then also the files will persist. Uh, even after, after the application that created that file gets uninstalled, these files will remain on the SD card. So an example that we found in our analysis is in the Kindle application. Um, so the Kindle application saves a bunch of data on the SD card. First of all, it saves um, the e-books on the SD card. Um, and this can be a problem because third-party party applications can read the SD card, which means they can get access to the e-books. So an attacker can have free e-books. Um, whether they can read it or not depends on the DRM. So some, some are um, not protected. Um, another issue is that the covers of the books are also saved to the SD card. And so this is a privacy violation. Um, some people are sensitive about others knowing what books they read. So this information should not be leaked. Um, and finally, the folder, after you uninstall the Kindle application, the folder uh, that contains all of this data retains on the SD card. So an example that you can think of is a common situation is, you know, users want to move on to the next cool phone, so they sell their old phone. And even if the old owner or the new owner does a factory reset on the phone, they, you know, they're clearing the data on the phone, it's not clearing the data on the SD card. So what happens is when the new owner, well, one, the new owner has access to the SD card, can just look at it. Um, they can also install the Kindle application, and the Kindle application will automatically look in this folder and load the books in that folder. So again, this is another privacy violation um, because we don't want other people to have access to our reading material. And now, um, the recommended fixes for this problem um, include, so you could do a couple things. You could write to the application's database. Uh, you could write to the device's internal storage for the application and make sure to make that file non-readable to other applications. And finally, if you have to store your data on the SD card, then make sure you encrypt that data if it's sens at all sensitive. Um, and of course, don't put the key on the SD card. People can read it. <laughs> okay. And now Katrina's going to talk about the remaining three ways. So the uh, security vulnerability number five that we uh, think developers can make is insecure network communication. <clears throat> and basically just like in the case of insecure storage, what we're worried about is leaking sensitive data. Only in the case of insecure storage, we're leaking uh, the sensitive data onto an SD card. In the case of uh, insecure network communication, we're leaking it uh, over HTTP. And now, obviously, this is not anything new. This is not a uh, vulnerability specific to mobile world or specific to Android. Um, this vulnerability existed uh, in regular web applications. And you think that we learned some from our mistakes, and we know that sensitive data needs to be sent over HTTPS. But no, turns out that's not the case. And here are some of the examples. So we use Wireshark to uh, sniff packets coming from the phone. And uh, here's an example, here's a screenshot of uh, what the mobile Twitter application sends over HTTP. And as you can see here, um, it sends the twit, which is basically the value of the status um, parameter in the clear. Uh, and in addition to that, it sends things like latitude and longitude of the person who's tweeting uh, along also in the clear. Obviously, both of these uh, pieces of information are sensitive because you know, one is the twin, another is the person's location. So the fact that anybody can access that is bad. Here's another example, um, Facebook application for Android. As you can see from the screenshot, it sends things like contact email, first name, last name, also in the clear over HTTP. 
And the most alarming part is that um, the, the regular web application um, allows you to uh, set preferences as to how you want your data sent uh, over HTTP or over HTTPS. But in the case of the mobile application for Facebook, this option doesn't exist and everything is just automatically sent over HTTP. So that's, that's pretty bad too. So what's the recommended fix? Obviously don't do it, don't leak sensitive data, uh, such as passwords and location, contacts, uh, use HTTPS when you use web, web views whenever possible, and just in general, think about your mobile application in the same way you would think about the regular web application. Because you know, in, a lot of, in, in, in a lot of cases they're very similar, and um, you know, most of the attacks that apply to regular web applications will probably apply to mobile applications as well. Problem number six is the good old SQL injection. Um, I probably don't have to explain what this is, but just basically the idea is that you know, untrusted, unvalidated data is used to uh, con dynamically construct SQL queries and that could lead to uh, bad things such as you know, deleting tables and injecting something into the database and all sorts of other things. Um, again, this is not new. Uh, this vulnerability is not specific to mobile, world, or Android. Um, and unfortunately, it still, can, it still happens even though, again, we, we, we've known about it for a long, long time. And here are some of the uh, APIs in the Google SDK that are susceptible to the regular SQL injection. So here are some methods from SQLite database class uh, that you should be aware of. Um, so in the case of the regular web applications, when we uh, think about untrusted input, we basically mean you know, input that comes from outside of the application. So things like you know, um, something that comes from a user interface or HTTP requests. Um, in the case of mobile world, you know, a mobile application, it probably doesn't really make sense to uh, think about user interfaces, untrusted data, because it's probably unlikely that you're going to be attacking yourself. But you know, all other types of untrusted sources still apply. So anything that comes from outside the application, such as you know, uh, if if the data comes from a, a different application, it should be treated as untrusted because that application could be malicious. Uh, or you know, if you're a user, you're browsing the web. You're clicking on some malicious link, and then all of that also needs to be trusted, uh, needs to be treated as untrusted. A subset of uh, a SQL injection vulnerability that we call query string injection vulnerability is something that doesn't allow you to modify the database, but allows you to view more records than you're supposed to, um, which basically, you know, makes it sort of an access control type vulnerability. Um, and, and just like in the case of SQL injection, it also happens because untrusted and validated data is uh, dynamically concatenated into a part of a SQL query. So basically, the, in terms of Android, the difference between the two is the APIs that are exposed to you. Some APIs allow you to specify the entire query uh, as a string. Some APIs allow you to specify parts of the query. And so uh, uh, that's how to differentiate between the two. Um, here is um, a specific example. Um, here is a call to a query API that basically, lets you, that basically returns um, uh, invoice records for uh, a product category for a particular customer with a specific customer ID sorted by the sort column. So if you supply you know, fax machines as the value of product category and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is the value of customer ID and price is the value of sort column, then uh, here is what your query is going to look like. And basically it returns you uh, invoice records for one customer, whose customer ID is 1234567.8. However, if you uh, have some piece of untrusted data come in and that, uh, and because of that the product category is set to something like fax machines or product category equals backslash quote, Customer ID is one two three four five six seven eight, and sort column is backslash quote order by price. Then your your query looks very very different. And 
if you stare at it long enough, you'll see that we basically were able to get around the check against the customer ID. And what that means is you now are able to see a return, uh, you see invoice records for all of the customers rather than the customer, rather than just one customer with customer ID one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which was the intent behind the code. So I hope I, it's not surprised anybody what the you know, fix behind SQL and query string injection vulnerability is. Parameterized queries. Um, make sure you use those and don't uh, just simply concatenate untrusted data into a SQL query. Um, make sure that you, know, you make it very, very clear which part of the query is the command and which part of the query is the data and that's what parameterized uh, queries do for you. The last and probably the most interesting and exciting security vulnerability we want to talk about is overprivileged applications. So overprivileged applications are applications that uh, request more permissions than they really need to in order to run successfully and correctly. So why is that bad? Well, first of all, it, um, it violates the principle of least privilege. Again, you're probably familiar with it. But basically the idea is that uh, you shouldn't have more authority than you really need to to perform a task. And so why is it bad if you do? Well then, if your application has a different type of vulnerability, then and an attacker is able to exploit it, then an attacker has control over, over your application and therefore has control, uh, has all the permissions that uh, the application requested and was probably granted even though the application didn't actually need all of those permissions. Well, another reason why it's bad is because basically people are getting used to these permission uh, checks pop up um, and you know, some users that are not as security savvy are gonna just click okay, okay, you know, I accept. And it, it's very uh, possible that they're gonna be downloading some malicious application that requests some scare permission because it needs to steal your data. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, if you're, you, if you know what security is all about, then you might be scared away and you don't want to download an application that's actually um, benign uh, and just, you know, requests a scary permission that it doesn't need. So what are, why, you know, overprivileged applications happen? What causes those? And our colleagues at Berkeley did some analysis and came up with a number of um, causes. And basically all of these causes stem from the fact that there is very, very little documentation provided by Google uh, for the developers in terms of which APIs require which permissions. And I'll come back to that discussion in a few slides. But because of that, you know, developers are left with either, you know, doing figuring this information out by trial and error, or guessing, or turning into message boards. And so here are some of the common causes. One of them uh, is the confusing permission names, and I'll show an example in a second. Others is uh, you know, testing artifacts, so there's a number of permissions that are used for testing, such as mock type permissions, and so you're supposed to remove them after you're done testing, and if you do not remove them, then you end up with an overprivileged um, application. Um, there's also confusion uh, between um, accessing a protected API versus invoking an application that accesses a protected API. And again, I'll have a, an example in a second. Um, also, there's something like something we call related methods. So, suppose you're a developer and you're accessing this service um, that has both getters and setters and only the setters require the permission. Uh, but you're only accessing getters so you actually don't need the permission. But just because you're accessing the service and there is no documentation provided, you might think that you, know, you need the permission and so you request it and end up with an overprivileged application. And finally, message boards and forums actually suggest wrong things. Um, so let's look at the, some examples. Here's an example uh, that illustrates the confusion between you know, uh, accessing a protected API versus um, 
invoking an application that accesses a protected API. So here we have two applications, a camera application, which actually takes a picture and, um, you know, accesses a camera, which obviously means she, it does need uh, a camera permission. But then there's also an app one, and all it does is that it asks uh, uh, the camera application for a picture. It doesn't actually take it, doesn't access the camera, so it doesn't need a camera permission. But the developer might think that, you know, well, my application has something to do with the camera, so it probably needs a camera permission. So, uh, and end up with an overprivileged application. Um, and here's an example of, uh, that illustrates both the confusing naming and also the, uh, you know, wrong suggestions given by uh, forums and message boards. So, for example, if you're registering for an uh, Android net Wi-Fi uh, state change intent, then it's suggested that you need an access Wi-Fi state uh, permission, but in reality, you don't. So what's the recommended fix? Well, the fix uh, is pretty clear. Just, to, you know, don't request more permissions than you really need to. Um, of course, it's easier said than done. And we think that the first thing that needs to happen is uh, for Google to improve their documentation. But in the meantime, you can use uh, automatic tools that identify overprivilege. A few words about empirical uh, results. So now that we talked about uh, the seven security mistakes that we think people can make uh, writing Android applications, you're probably wondering, are these mistakes actually you know, real? Do they happen in real applications? And uh, this table should convince you that they are indeed real. So we looked at a bunch of different applications. We scanned them with our tools, uh, with many different tools because we have several tools that we use, and we did some manual investigation, and so you can see that, for example, unauthorized intent receipts happen in 50% of applications that we've looked at, intent spoofing happens in 40% of applications. Uh, in 6% of applications, we've seen the usage of sticky broadcasts. 20% 28% of applications uh, write some sensitive, some sort of sensitive data to insecure storage onto SD card. 17% uh, have SQL or query string injection, and 31% of all the applications we looked at uh, turned out to be overprivileged. Uh, good question. So the question is what happened to secure insecure network communication? We don't unfortunately have a good set of data for that. We, so we've talked about the two examples that we've seen and we thought that it's important to mention them, but we don't actually have the data because it's not that easy to find these things with, uh, with static analysis tools, which is what we've been using. So some challenges that we had to overcome. Coding conventions are um, in, the, in the form of callbacks and the Java reflection are pretty difficult to handle by um, traditional static analysis tools. And Another big challenge is the documentation. And I was personally shocked to see how little uh, of it uh, is documented and somehow we we're expecting developers to write secure Android applications. And in fact, uh, my colleagues at Berkeley, while they were doing analysis over privileged applications, they did analysis of the documentation and uh, they realized that Android 2.2 documents permissions for only 78 out of 1,207 APIs that the team found. And uh, in fact, uh, six out of these 78 APIs were documented incorrectly. So for example, uh, one permission that was mentioned didn't even exist. In terms of uh, which tools identify which vulnerabilities, Fortify's tool currently uh, can identify five out of the presented vulnerabilities, and Berkeley tools identify four, and after we collaborate and combine the two analysis, we plan to be able to identify six um, out of the seven uh, automatically with the tools. Our work and research and this talk were in inspired by a number of other researchers and some of their names, names of some of them are on the slide. So if you want to learn more, go read those people's work. And just in conclusion, 
we'd like to say that, uh, well, it's clear that Android has uh, a set of security pitfalls itself, and uh, we think that static analysis tools can help developers avoid um, a lot of these problems. And uh, again, we're very, very excited for the Fi software and Berkeley to be working together and incorporating you know, the state-of-the-art analysis into Fortify's tools that are going to be used and are used by a lot of enterprises all over the world. And th this is the end of our talk. Thanks very much, and we're open to questions, or you can come and ask us more.